instead of us just drawing the numbers tonight for the lotto, the uh, Rhode Island Gaming Commission has authorized, they in fact directed that tonight, instead of drawing the numbers, that the winner will be determined on the basis of a question I'm supposed to ask. <clears throat> Here it is. If you died in your sleep and didn't know it, and next morning while in the shower heard the news of your death on the radio, would the shock kill you? <laughs> I think 333 three, three would have been easier. <clears throat> also, I would like to, if I may, uh, if not apologize, beg for your forbearance in advance. For as I go along tonight and I begin to reveal the intimate details of my personal life, I would like, I'd like to ask your understanding in case, during that period, in case I don't cry or show any particular sensitivity or interest in it. <clears throat> that's, the end of, that's the end of the intro stuff. And now, I'll reveal for the very first time on this planet the original true story of the truth. <laughs> once, once the truth existed, but to hide itself, it made man begin debating its existence. Uh -huh. And now for the latest version of the true story of the truth. We, speaking for man, are now beyond mere truth. <laughs> to be satisfied is to be dumb. To be dumb is to be, dis is to be satisfied. What could be fairer than that? Even if you're too dumb to realize it. <laughs> the instructor opened class by announcing the day's topic. Cosmology explained, crudely yet correctly. Your brain, the sun. Your persona, earth. Your mind, the moon. And a boy in back said, but professor, what about the oceans? You didn't account for them. Okay, man wets his pants. <laughs> Homeowner's news, we all live in our genes, and some favor one room over another. The reason penthouses cost more than basement apartments is that they're closer to tomorrow. One man's latest conspiratorial theory, quoting, it is the publicly serious who control our cities, while it is the backstage greedy who insouciantly control the publicly serious. This man insists that he is really on to something this time. Mostly, whenever he drove, this one man carried along someone else with him in the trunk. Then, after better learning local highway conditions, he put himself back there and closed the lid airtight. <laughs> to believe that life is out of my hands, even if true, is to be ordinary. To believe that life is out of my hands, even if true, is to be religious. To believe that life is out of my hands, even if so, is to be forever fearful. To believe that life is out of my hands is to live in a self-consuming incendiary daze that distracts the mind and blinds the eye so that one looks always over here or over there, but never head on at life as it is. All of this, and more woe be so, when a man accepts the idea that life is out of my hands and beyond my control, and that so far as is applicable and useful to the few, its veracity is totally irrelevant. What is a true mythical hero if not he who will relentlessly press onward regardless of what the storytellers say are the impossible circumstances? To never see what is possible is to forever be captive of the impossible. Fact. Notice, attention, heads up, and watch it. Those who need an apologist need a hell of a lot more than an apologist. Daddy, why does he sometimes use the singular when he makes statements like that and other times uses the plural? City psychologist skinned and fried. Making peace with yourself does seem like the least one can do, inasmuch as it was never otherwise. And a rapid-fire viewer quickly replies, Aha! 
but only recently you yourself described the human mind as a wound never intended to heal. Explain yourself. I will. An unhealing wound is always well, a constant complaint, a sigh of acceptance. Hey, Durango, fry me one of them there couch crouching wildcats. <laughs> Those who seek for voices, hear voices. And those who search for signs, see signs. But the few who wish to view the unbiased edge of the universe without the aid of extrinsic equipment, well, people like that don't need no shit like signs. <laughs> After life originally looked man dead in the eye and man blinked and turned away, Man then began to refer, in retrospect, to plain reality by such names as God, the Creator, the Absolute, and so on. But the particular names are of no importance. The original, the operational significance simply is that life was given a name by man and thus moved a step away from his awareness. The origins and subsequent evolution of what we now call philosophy. The philosophy of a dieter society is different from that of a pizza maker's convention. <laughs> and now this motoring feature, used cars, used or abused. Men with important titles and positions are a serious lot. There are people of another land who hold this idea. A more conscious man has no mind of his own but has the mind of everyone. Declare as one man, I fear nothing imaginary save my own stupidity and self-righteousness. Ms. Bottlemeyer, should I file this one under adult fairy tales? A little library humor. <laughs> one man's theory of how to maintain good verbal health. Gargle in your own mental sweat. And now a brief, refreshing interlude. Oh, daddy, daddy, hear the dead man say that the AMA has made their day. Now watch it there, son. Don't you go too far or we'll be dancing with members of the bar. Fear not, papa. Let your tongue run free because those dumb as us have immunity. <laughs> Don't forget now, three times a day, gargle thoroughly with your own mental sweat and careful not to confuse the words dumb and forthright. <laughs> the inspirational speaker concluded his speech with this inspirational thought. Remember, to make eggs, you've got to break some chickens. <laughs> Another way you can really tell Another way that you can tell that you're really interested in such as this is that not only can you not explain why you are, but you've lost all interest in trying to. And now, another episode of If. <laughs> if a more conscious man hated anything, it'd be the dead. And if, in case you don't get it, remember, nothing is deader than the past. <laughs> Some myth makers in another solar system were talking and fell into discussing just what was the foremost ingredient in becoming a god. And one of them said, the main requirement is to have unlimited power. But another countered, no, the first thing you've got to have, no, the first thing you need is supreme wisdom. And a third voice injected, no, the first thing you've got to have is a name. And they all immediately realized the validity of his observation. Another brief dip into our dictionary. History. The failing attempt to remember. More poetry regarding the dual citizenship of man. Men with small brains will go to great pains to dress in the latest of style. Those with small minds will, must bust their behinds to run and compete with the pros. Eyes glued to the ball can in fact make you fall if the game being played is not your own. 
while birth is a scheme that chooses your team, some later, free agency, shout. <laughs> Additional verse that may make it worse. <laughs> they spotted the ball on the 40-yard line as adrenaline dribble I wiped from my mind. A team on the right and one on the left, both pressure above and below, I felt. Remember, boys and girls, a hobby is no longer a hobby if you take it seriously. His take on one important subject, one man describes Dustly Wesley. <laughs> the primo aspect of being a verbal creature amidst a civilized collection of others similarly structured is in having a forum wherein one is able to publicly whine with an audience. <laughs> I already apologized in advance. Flash! After trying this kind of stuff for a while, one person's mind began to work differently. So watch it. <laughs> the great transcendental duck in charge of one city one day said to its people, <laughs> I'm not sure there's any great cause to always be laughing at those in, in the body politic. The great transcendental duck in charge of one city one day said to its people, I, speaking allegorically, feel sorry for all of you who can only judge your pleasure in being alive by your measuring of success of the kind visible to others. Quack. <laughs> I had lived that. It wasn't, it wasn't part of it. <laughs> now back to our electronic classroom of the air for this literary definition. Writing. Comparing one word with another. <laughs> now over to our visiting professor of the day for his comment regarding criticism. Those who can, cook. And those who can't, throw up. <laughs> Daddy, is that why so many men, yes son, why so many men wear shoes? <laughs> the ordinary like to praise their own write biographies, give awards, erect statues, and the like. They like to praise their own, for what else do they sense? A viewer sends in this question to the show. Dear sir, mine is a two-parter. First, let me ask. I shouldn't have even tried to look, should I? First, let me ask, if people did not take routine life so seriously, would stuff like you do still exist? And secondly, if stuff like you do was really serious, would it continue to exist? Sincerely, ETC. Now an update to, in the score of a game we covered for you earlier this evening. Over in the collective league between those dressed as hormones and those made up as neurons. The score. A hobby is no longer a hobby once it becomes a team sport. <laughs> At the local level, the distinction between the objective and the subjective is the same as between a dry spot of beach and an incoming wave. One day, one part of one man's brain pondered. Why? Would a more conscious man tell anybody anything for which the rest of him had no reply? <laughs> one day, one boy in the back of the garage moved. If you built a limo long enough, long enough that when it went around a corner, it would meet its own rear end. If you built one that long, then who would drive and what would be the minimal rental hours? <laughs> one day... A new man in town got a new job at a mirror factory. 
But on the way to work on his first day, some strangers in a long limousine whizzed by him and stole all of his consciousness. <laughs> Man's mental perceptions as an unstable Klein bottle. First man says, whenever I use a shampoo, I get a headache. And the next man says, every time I eat fish, I develop dandruff. The page said, yeah, I, I know you warned me. <laughs> one man decided that each and every day he'd make at least one really dumb, clumsy, and embarrassing blunder just so as to remind himself of his own fallible humanity. <laughs> Truth was, this wasn't actually necessary. Run it by me again, won't you all, though? It's the title. Giving this kind of stuff a name and structure tends to make it less of this real kind of stuff. The personal stumbling block of a question, to wit, how cometh Homo sapien to be supreme amongst all creatures, finally unstumped? Were it not for our big toe, man would not be where he is today. Vera, does that mean the big toe of our foot or of our mind? Damn it, Dewey, do I have to answer every damn question in the world for you? <laughs> Awareness with no internal resistance comes awfully close to real consciousness. That's indeed correct, Sir Malcolm, but so does a snake on a bus with a shoulder shawl. <laughs> Mike. <laughs> My God, Cardinal, Cardinal Laszlo, do you realize what this means? It means that everything means something else. It means that everything means everything else. Hiss, hiss, madam, but is this seat already taken? <laughs> Query, what is required to be of continuing sound and normal mind? The ability to totally turn your back on the obvious. One man had his own electronic cooking show, but it wasn't on TV, and it wasn't about food. <laughs> hey boy, ask his father, why is all of the truly important knowledge man has always, all the important knowledge man has always in allegorical form? And the elder replied, the answer to that question is in that question, as all of you should know by now. And now the hog prices. If repetition is the answer, then where do all the questions keep coming, keep coming, keep coming from? <laughs> According to an unconfirmed rumor currently circulating, the driver of a local Greyhound recently stopped in the middle of a highway and announced to all on board, you might as well shut up and quit whining. Every bozo on this bus is a victim. <laughs> Those, as part of the original mother myth, who did not blink and turn away when confronted eye to eye with life, and who did not forget the secret that everyone once knew, those men, after they began to recall and re-see it all, and began to become their own mythical knight, must then never retreat or excuse themselves. For a living hero, once dead, cannot be revived. One father's advice to his son, never deal in even numbers. As he sailed upon the dragonfly thought, what is it like to be a frog, more conscious, yet still in the mud. While on the street in the ice cream truck, the cold asks itself, what is it like to be a popsicle, out on your own, out on the run? After having one of those kind of years, a boy asked his mother, just how much can you regret something? To which she replied, a lot. 
if you remember it. A gentleman viewer writes in to say that if they ever come up with a form of intellectual eroticism, then he'll consider taking up thinking. <laughs> and now Professor Wadlow's latest theory. The ending of everything is the beginning of something else. And the frustrated boy mentioned above retorts, you're just saying that to make me feel better. And Dr. Wadlow responded by mooning the lad. <laughs> Moral, all's well that goes to hell. A tip to help, help you stay alert once you've permanently taken over your own driving duties. A man with three eyes can't take a nap. A trade secret to being human and ordinary. If you want people to really feel sorry for you, just tell them what kind of guy you really are. <laughs> Throughout the city rang the message, words are magic. And a boy asked his father, is that true? And the man replied, yes, if you're a dunce. <laughs> Would you like to go over and stay with us? Up? No. Maybe you guys... Even while home, some secrets can be slipped through the door if your receptor is a consciousness at ease. There are two main reasons that many people have a small opinion of themselves. One is that they have a lot to have a small opinion about. <laughs> and the other is that that's all they're capable of. The condemned man in the next cell was heard to say, I don't mind so much the dying as I do the dying before I actually ever lived. Note to those keeping a viewer's diary. This was not a philosophical or allegorical comment, but a plain physical observation regarding neural development. In the city, everyone's an expert since there's nothing to be an expert about. The personal standard of one night was, he who needs help, needs help. Being uncertain, weak, wounded, or lost is one thing. Admitting you are something else entirely. And now another useful viewer's tip. How not to get a cult going. Get a bunch of people together and tell them how life actually works. <laughs> another way of yes looking at it being more conscious will not permanently keep you from ever being stupid again it just keeps you from enjoying it <laughs> truth and honesty are only important to sincere people. <laughs> the sincere are serious. Serious people believe themselves singularly important. Thus, doubles, thus, serious people and truth and honesty are the same thing and double thus of no particular importance. And if you don't agree with this, tell a lie and steal a turnip. <laughs> the featured guest at this month's meeting walked to the podium and said the subject for my speech tonight is linguistics and reality about which I have nothing to say and he left <laughs> <laughs> and just arrived your birthday definition being alive being on the verge of really being alive Hey, viewers, lighten up. It's really pretty simple. Colon. If you can think without thinking about it, you can do this. And somewhere a young boy thought, you know, if I was my father, I guess I'd be serious too. And somewhere else a non-standard viewer suddenly wonders, if someone who just listens to stuff like this 
is someone who just listens to stuff like this, like a declawed cat who still can't sing. Uh -huh. And further on, out, somewhere, out there. Another lad mused. You know, if I was as dumb as I used to be, I'd still be serious too. This kind of stuff redefined again, and the not last time. For the not last time. This kind of stuff is the answer to the question no one knows how to ask. A man wondered, can just being continually expo exposed to hearing life being continually exposed eventually cause you to become more conscious? Such men should ask themselves, do cats constantly privy to birds finally begin to cheep? A man with no relentless force of will and unconditional intention is like a knight with no horse. Not even an imaginary horse. Which is the only kind possible. And that knights themselves are mythical. What should be grasped from this is that normal notions of real and imaginary and of what is possible and what is not are far beneath the pragmatic dignity of a living, functioning night. Beyond all mutterings regarding the mundane and divine, past all debates over pantheism or monism, transcending all questions of change and stagnation, is the understanding that life is alive, which explains everything. Now, there were several here tonight that seems to be related. One of them was fairly long about if you believe that, quote, life is out of my hands, even if true. And it goes on for four or five lines, if you recall, and it points out what that would imply about the person. That if you believe, quote, that life is out of my hands, even if it's true. To be that way is to be ordinary, is to be religious, is to be forever fearful. And I could have gone on for pages and pages. The last one that I put down was to believe that life is out of my hands, even if it's true. It's to live in a self-consuming incendiary daze that distracts the mind and blinds the eye. And so that one is always looking over here, over there, and never head on directly, point blank, at life as it is. This is one of the great areas we skate around, if any of you noticed. A lot of times, because this will take the absolute wind out of, all right, truth in advertising. <laughs> this will take the imaginary wind out of all imaginary forms of mysticism. <laughs> and great, imaginary forms of great secret works. Because you always get down to this. I'll codify it into a simple sentence. I know it comes out in many other variations, but is it possible to do something extraordinary? According to what the would-be system is, is it possible to blow one's consciousness into the universe? Is it possible to wake up to a new level of consciousness? Is it possible to understand what's going on? But all this means one thing. It is saying, is it possible for me to do something extraordinary? Is it possible for me to change in an personally extraordinary way. Assuming that you're wired up to believe that it is, to feel that it is, to hope that it is, enough so that you devote some energy to it. Then if you're ordinary, the first thing that you do is look for external direction, expecting, nay demanding, some practice, something to do. And the practices always are related to behavior. Which, I'll point out one more time, at least, is a safety valve. It's an easy way out that if you believe that there was a, some great push and hunger in your life to do something extraordinary, and you went through processes of taking dope and you know, reading books and trying to chase down uh, gurus and teachers and et cetera, and you finally 
find one that seems right for you or some system or some monastery, some guy. And uh, you say, this is it. I've heard you talk. I read your book. I read your brochure. This has got to be it. What do I do? And they say, well, all right, here's the first thing. Here are the basic rules. And it's always about behavior. And they say, you know, you've got to give up sex. You've got to give up coffee. You've got to give up smoking. You've got to give up drinking. You've got to do something. But it's always behavior. And all the way from religions to the apparently more esoteric, cultish systems, it's always behavior, the bottom, the front end loading part, is always something that is possible. You know, you, you may say, good God, I don't give up coffee or Cokes or you know, drinking. Well, I know you don't, but you got to. Oh, all right, I'll try or I'll think about it. But when it gets into real change, such as, remember where this is, to believe that life is out of my hands. Such as a person, whether somebody's told him or not, let's say that the person I just made up got a little bit better, that there was a little more to him than being a member of some group. What you've got to remember is that great Western mystic Groucho Marx said, any mystical group that have him, no, screw them. Might waste your time being part of a group that have you. I'm not sure that's exactly what he had in mind, but who knows, he's dead and he won't return my phone calls to clarify it. And in fact, he stole it, but I, I don't have time to go into that. Uh, but getting into something that would seem to be more personal, let's assume that this person who has a desire and a hunger to do something extraordinary, to scratch some place that they can't even find a reasonable definition of where the itch is. So they drift away from groups and books and etc. But then perhaps they decide on their own, or maybe somebody tells them, or they remembered it from a book or something. It's not just behavior, but it's something like, I've got to control my greed in life. See, which is getting, now we're talking about, I don't mean the greed of actually going out and stealing. We're not behavior, that now the person takes it more personally that's inside of my own nervous system. My own, the kind of understanding, the kind of goo and lightning inside my own nervous system that then results in behavior. Or I shouldn't be so angry. I'm always hostile. I'm always believing that people are you know, picking on me or that somebody's going to take advantage of me. You know, I, I've got to stop that. And remember, not the behavior. I know that you could bring that on out to behavior and turn it into or recall some canon from any religion. But we're talking about now as a person, for their own reason, they think, you know, I've got to stop this. It's just foolish. And it's, it, taking all my energy is just a waste of time. It's, I've got to stop it. And then a person is faced with this. It's now not something like, well, here's a great change you must make. You must give up a bad hobby you picked up since you... I've been on this planet. That kind of self-improvement. Yes, I'll improve myself. I'll quit taking dope. After 40 years, in other words, I'll get back to where I was. <laughs> hey, they don't call me Big Bill for nothing. Iron of, Big Bill, iron of will. The question becomes what we're getting at. Is then a person... Not just behavior, not just giving up a habit that you've already picked up, but it seems to be striking at your own persona. God, I've always been kind of an edgy guy. I've always you know, been thinking that you know, I used to fight my brothers and sisters, all my playmates. I always thought, you know, what are you looking at? I was always like that. And I know, you know, I, I should stop it. And we're assuming now that the guy's beyond the external directions of just behavior from some collective group, some religious group, or some cult, telling him, he just understands. In other words, for no reason, I just, he knows he should stop it. Wasting energy. And then a guy thinks, he tries it, let's say. He thinks about it. It is very common to you, that you end up to a point of, is there, what I'm getting at, is there such a thing as free will? You don't have to be a philosopher. You don't have to be a philosopher of any ilk. You don't have to be a philosopher of any school. You don't have to put it in those words. But that is what it gets to. All the way from academic philosophy, who only do it as a hobby, down to the most fundamental, crude, unsophisticated religious people in the world, that they're faced with the same thing. Well, whatever their religion is, they says, well, our God, our great cosmic force, our great teacher, says that we should... Not be angry. We should not express anger to our brother, especially here in our same organization, our same religion. 
And a man's faced with this. He, you know, an angry man. Let's back to the, the same guy. A guy's got a temper. And he says, all right, I got to. And he finds that he just can't do it. Then he's left with this, which is of no importance, but it's one of the places that religions kind of treat like a dusty corner of a kitchen that you don't know what to do with. Yeah. Is, well... You know, I'm here and I'm playing the game and I'm trying to live by the rules the best I can. I'm going through the rituals. But when it gets down to some of these things that the religion says that, you know, I should not be angry. I keep getting angry. Is it God making me angry? I mean, I'm trying to serve him. How come he won't help? How come I can't? I think about it all the time. Every time I get angry nowadays, I'm so aware of it. Every time I get angry, I go, darn it, don't be angry. Stop that. You did it again. And I can't stop it. And that's when all religions, of course, all we're talking about now is the polarized nature of intellectual energy on this planet, but you'd have priests and rabbis ahead of some group and they have to go collectively. They go, well, well, and you say, well, Father, help me, you know, Rabbi, help me. How can I, I, I believe it. I, I, I accept that I should not be angry. I have been trying. Do I not come to you once a month? And I tell you, do I not come to confession? I keep saying how bad I feel. What can I do? Is it, why is God, when I pay my money, and I come to the services, why does God make me either continue to be of angry when he says not to? You told me he said not to, yeah? Well, why does he either make me keep doing it, or why does he let me keep doing that and won't give me the strength to do it? I try, and I cannot do it. I'm telling you the truth, as sincere as I can be. And the guy goes, the father says, yeah. Well, Why? And they have to go, well. <laughs> and it's down to, whether they've used the terms or not, it's down to a matter of, well, can we change? Do I have free will or not? Do I have any control of my life or not? Ordinary people do not, they cannot go around worrying about that because it would immobilize people. <laughs> it would. It would immobilize life collectively. Human life, intellectual life. But you are left with this, operationally, whether you ever say the words or not. And that is, if you accept that life is out of your hands, if you accept that we are locked into this, I was born with a real rotten temper. I was born with a bad personality. I have never been neat. I've never been nice. Uh, I can quit drinking. I can quit smoking. I can... Uh, Go to meetings, I can go to, I can do rituals, I can light candles, I could be a good Jew, I could be a good Catholic, I could join this cult, I could join that cult. When it comes to changing what I seem to be, forget it. And if you get really good, that is of eyesight, then the older you get, you might think, wait a minute. Especially if somebody says, you realize your temper's not as bad as it used to be. If there's anything to you, you think, big deal. You know, I'm just getting fat and 40. Inside, I'm, I'm about as pissed as I used to be. Just, uh, in other words, what I was sort of trying to point out to you, which is not simply a matter of age, because it's already upon everyone, is the danger. I'm talking about the functional danger of trying to take credit for anything that happens, which is sort of the third side, not the other side of the coin I'm talking about tonight. At any rate, is that the world's greatest segue or not? At any rate, which means, well, never mind all that, even if none of us understand it. But at any rate, to believe that, quote, life is out of my hands. Not just generally, not just philosophically, but let's say that there you are trying your best. I cannot get over my temper. So, in that case, my life is out of my hands. I cannot change. What if that's true? Because the full sentence says, yeah, it does have a little significance the way I was trying to, to believe that, quote, life is out of my hands. Your life, some aspect, like temper. To believe that, quote, life is out of my hands, in parentheses, even if true, in the parentheses. Blah, blah, blah. Even if it's true, Even if it's true. Now after that, let's assume there was an ellipse there. Even if true, and we'll come back to it. Even if true, 
Now let's jump. At least parenthetically, we'll start another paragraph. Even if true, if you're ordinary, then where does that leave you? No worse off than you were to start with. In fact, if you're kind of an ordinary person with a streak of weasel in you, you'd feel like you're a little better off because it's like, well, hey, it's not as bad as I thought. I mean, if that's the truth, if you accepted it psychologically or apparently from a religious source, if you were given the information and you accepted it, and somebody says, hey, quit worrying about trying to affect your temper. Is that your big problem? Yes. Let me tell you what. And at some source, a guy dressed up like a super rabbi or a great priest or something, you know, a man who looks like Freud's grandfather come back to life dressed as Nero with a skull cap and a cross or whatever. And looks like Buddha from the side. Anyway, something what, that has an effect on you. And suddenly this spirit comes and says, you still worried about your temper. You've been working on that all the time. You feel like that's the stumbling block between you and the great mystical awakening. Yes, there's no doubt. It's got to be one of them. Give it up. I mean, it was a nice try, but you've been trying, you've been working on this while. How many years have you been aware that you considered your temper to be the problem? And you think, well, all right, 15, 20. It doesn't give you, you got no hint. Uh, well, I felt like I was weak. And in in this force, this spirit that has an impact on you, an overwhelming, it says, hey, people are what they are. Your intention was good. It's good that you're aware of it. But hey, life is out of your hands when it gets down to that level that you're going to change what you are. Because the day is even coming here with ordinary people, but you people I've already tried to take into the future. You know, psychology is going to be a, as dead as religion is. That is, I'm going to change what I am. That Psychologically, I am something that came about no longer from spirits, most people now. It's from psychological spirits. It comes about from hormones. <laughs> yes, but my personality was shaped. Hormones! No, let me finish. My personality, you don't know my background. Har friggin' moans. No, 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 no. I've had, no, no. My, back, my, my childhood was full of hormones! <laughs> That's psychology. That, that, that is not workable psychology today, but that psychology. So, the person, you understand, an ordinary person, that's this kind of spirit came to him and says, hey, life is out of your hands. But it, maybe it threw in a little bit like, nice try. We've been watching. We know that you meant well. We know that you've actually tried. But, you know, we let it go. Now, for 20 years, we let you work on it. But you see you're no better off. You cannot change what your DNA is. You cannot change what you are genetically. As I said, if you're ordinary, you'd be no worse off. And if you were part weasel, you'd probably feel a little bit better. You'd think you're a little better off. <laughs> Even if true, now, remember that was one paragraph. Now let's forget the ordinary. Let's assume that we're talking about you. We're talking about someone who... What if it's true? What if this, you know, some spirit did swoop down? And I say, spirit, I'm not being funny. Something struck you in such a way that you, you had to give it buku's a possible credence. That you had something approaching a more than just a dime store moment of insight. And it struck you that life may be totally out of our hands. My own life. My own, everything I've done is everything extraordinary I've tried. Everything extraordinary that I've suspected. Even things I've done that I didn't think I could do. Habits I've changed or changes I've made myself. And suddenly this thing came to you. You don't have to be a spirit, but just a realization struck you. That's all sort of illusionary. That whatever change you apparently did, it just happened. And the same with other people can't change. That your own life is out of your hands when it gets down to you talking about the level of what you are personally, which is your hormones. It is your DNA. It's not like changing clothes. It's not like trading in a car. It's not even like leaving one bad habit. Well, I quit smoking. That's really a little. What if that struck you? Now we're back to the same beginning of the paragraph I just did for ordinary people. What if it did strike you? That life is out of my hands, and even if it's true, 
Now remember, we're not talking about ordinary people anymore. What if that were true? Now if one out was an ordinary person, they would be no worse off. In fact, many of them would feel like, I'm better off. If it was a potentially more conscious person, a true mythical knight, a person who's going to be their own nervous system hero, whatever you want to call it for the time being, what would that information, what would you do with it? Where would that put you? What change, what would that alter? Is that yucky enough? <laughs> In other words, I'll put it to you this way. I can rephrase myself. How would that alter things for you to find out that things couldn't be altered? <laughs> You feel like your brain's being taken over by Rod Stein? No, who is it? <laughs> Rod Serling. Sterling? Rod Serling? What was his name? Plus, just think, if he came back with a twilight zone in your head, if you don't know, he died from lung cancer. So you'd, n you'd not only have somebody weird taking over your brain, you'd suddenly take up smoking. <laughs> anyway, it was just a thought. And one that the network saw fit to cancel many years ago, so don't worry. In what position would that put one if it did strike you absolutely that all ideas of changing what you are, and I'm not going to stand here and try to debate it much further or play with the words, that what you are personally, what seems to be you, your personality, which is your hormones, it's just your own individual genetic wiring. Now, I know that Seems like some people need glasses, some don't. Some people seem shy, and they've got an excuse why they're shy. Some people say, some people just seem to be as pushy as a New York street vendor. And you think, well, you should have seen his father. No wonder he's like that. <laughs> See, that's the, beautiful thing about the dual, that's the beautiful thing about the dual citizenship of humanity, is you can find somebody who's timid and weak, and you can explain it. You don't even have to have a degree in psychology. You don't have to know who it is, just somebody, a friend of theirs, somebody in the office said, well, I happen to know her story. Her mother had mental problems anyway, was, didn't speak for 10 years. You know. I mean, does that explain it or not? Sure it does. Other than this, you know, it doesn't explain shit. But it fits, it fits. Now, the other guy in the office is just so belligerent, so aggressive that, you know, People say, God, you know, sometimes you get him you know, maybe a few drinks or calm down. He's not such a bad guy, but the way he normally runs through here like he thinks he's General Patton. And somebody said, yeah, I know. I, I used to feel the same way. What's weird, I went home with him one Christmas about two years ago. You ought to see his father. His father's like, his father's like a 500-pound guy, and he just knocks kids and his wife and everybody around. They live in a trailer that the sides of it, and none but it looks like it's got the mumps from places that he just put his. And you go. Because the truth is, does that explain it or not? And you go, well. That is the beauty of having the dual citizenship of living in hormone land and urine land. Because that's what every human does to each other. That's what psychology is, academic, or that's what psychology now is, what religion is. It's what common sense is among people. You say, well, why is it? Or you, you, know, you look at one family, and they say, how is it that Bob is such a shy and decent, you know, quiet guy, and his sister, the same family, oh, you know, Edna there, she is like just a walking, just, I mean, she just drives you nuts. The same family. And then somebody can say, well, here's what's strange, you know, they're, about five years difference in their ages. Yeah, something like that, I guess. Well, do you know that her mother divorced their father right at the time? Well, uh, Bob, I think, was by then, he was like, you know, 12 or 13, but she was like five or six, just beginning to get some bonding to a male, you know, figure when they split up and she moved to another state. And Vera had that, that critical time from, it was approximately six to about 12 before her mother remarried, no male influence. Does that explain it or not? <laughs> well, all right, I can be intelligent. Yes and no. <laughs> of course, uh, that was for the commercial audience. For you people, the answer is no and no. You know? Yeah, it seems to explain it, but that's the thing about being neural 
and hormonal. And people say, how in the world can we be like this? <laughs> well, wait till I tell you her background. Let me tell you what happened to him. <laughs> and you hear it and you think, well, there but for the grace of God. <laughs> you know, it could have been me. Of course, I got a better one to... Since all adages had some basis to start with, they all need to be refurbished and brought up to date. It shouldn't, the phrase should not be, there but for the grace of God go I. It should be, there but for the sake of another excuse go I. <laughs> there but for the sake that no one's asked me about it. But I've got to remember it in case they do. I'll use that one. All right, back to that there is no excuse. What, what if you did see for yourself, and I... I always hate these words, and I say I hate these words, I'm not really referring, making a comment about me, it's that you should too, to even say things like, to even infer, to even get close enough to start talking about things like, well, does man have free will? <laughs> it's like you've already, you know, it's like a, the possibility of a nice summer picnic, and suddenly somebody pisses in a pickle barrel. <laughs> to even talk about it, to even bring the subject up. <laughs> And then it's like it's kind of too late. You can't drain the barrel. You can't play like it didn't happen. <laughs> but since we are standing here talking and not playing hide the knockworts, <laughs> and silently at that, which is the only way you're supposed to play hide the knockworts. Back to the rhetorical confrontation. What if you, let's try it silently, I've already put the words on, but what if the realization struck you? All but certain, they just struck you personally. And I'm going to go ahead and say the words, it's sickening, and I shouldn't do it, but we, here we are talking. That it struck you that it may, just by and large, just, it may be everything but absolutely just this side of 100% certainty that there's nothing you can do about what you are. What if that strikes you? And I'm talking about you as being a non-standard mental person. That it strikes you that you know, there's always that much room. Because everyone has that spot on the side of your little Ken or Bobby Barbie body where there's that one little spot that it might bust out where the injector mole was closed up. The navel of the mind, as I told you. So there's always that one little... But if it just strikes you that but for all intents and purposes, after all I've done, after all I understand, it just strikes me, the idea may be just ludicrous, just illusionary, that you can change what you are. Not all the superficial stuff of lose weight, gain weight, stop smoking, because you had to start to begin with, quit drinking. Well, you had to start drinking. We're talking about what you are in the nervous system. If it strikes you, it's out of my hands. It is all but certain that that's an illusion. And if you're still a would-be knight, what, what are the implications of that? Where do you go from there? What would that do? Remember, an ordinary person, I'm trying to give you something to compare it to, an ordinary person, if they were convinced of that, which they will not be, cannot be, should not be, but if an ordinary person is struck, then wait a minute, what I am, that's it. They would be no worse off, which is not true, but I'll say it, than they are now. They'd be worse off if everyone felt that way. We've been through that because that'd be, when I said it's not true, humanity is not going to think that because that would be suicidal. But if an individual person somewhere thought that. In case any of you have any doubt, there have been many religions. Sizable groups of people. It just comes and goes and flows from one part of the planet to the other. They believe in predestination. That Well, here we are. That is not the mainstream of humanity, but the point I'm trying to tell you is a few people here and there can even accept it and go, well, all right. So they're no worse off, is all I'm saying, individually, here and there. But if somebody who is not standard, somebody who is not part of the mainstream, Somebody who's not part of the howdy doody river of life. <laughs> what, what if it strikes you? What if, the, what if it strikes you that it's all but a certainty 
that, that ideas of changing what you are genetically, which is what you are, not hair color, not weight, not bad habits, but changing what you are, is out of your hands. It's, just, it's an illusion. It's spurious, if not specious. What if that? What if it struck you? In what position would that put you? What would that imply? What would you make of that? What would that do to you? Well, we're close enough, then I'll go ahead and give you one possible answer. It can't do anything to you, even if it's true. <laughs> because if it does, you're dead. And I wanted to point out, to get down to... some of the rest of this that if you accept any of these ideas that if you accept that life is out of my hands and let it have any of the effects I point out that if you, if you saw that if you understood that and it still had any of the effects I mentioned just any kind of ordinary effect then you are all of this that I point out above that you'd be religious, you'd be fearful etc all of this and more woe be so that is more than I even said. That if you accept the idea that life's out of my hands and me on my control, you'd, all that would happen and worse. But, insofar as it might be applicable and useful to a few, that is you, the veracity of it, whether it's true or not, even though I said it, what if it is true? But if it's true or not, is irrelevant. I should have stopped there since that would irritate any ordinary mind because the sense makes sense, but you can't go through all I've gone through if you tried to follow it sincerely. And then go, wait a minute, you can't say it's irrelevant. What else can it be? What if you saw it was true? Now, all but certain it's true. If it is not then, if you see it, if it's not irrelevant, you're done for. Put it crudely. What if you saw it's true? Then it's got to be like, hey, so what? <laughs> What are you going to do? You're like a knight ready to go out on the great quest and you suddenly find out that your horse is imaginary. <laughs> that somebody points out or you realize, wait a minute, the horse, the steed that was going to carry me on this great mystical quest, it's imaginary. I mean, is that as bad as finding out well, there's nothing I can do? It's the same thing, right? Except I point out also that that doesn't matter. Even though if... The steeds that carry mystical knights, if they're imaginary, so what? Knights are imaginary. <laughs> what are you, nuts? <laughs> what are you, crazy? <laughs> what, is, what is a true mythical knight? We got any t time left on the tape? Okay. What is a true mythical hero if not he who will relentlessly press onward regardless of what the storytellers, the storytellers say are the impossible circumstances. The storytellers are not religion. It's not a priest. It's not a rabbi. It's life going through your own mind. And it's for you to say, wait a minute, there's nothing I can do about this. That's the storyteller. If you say, wait a minute, I'm locked into what I am. A real knight presses on regardless of what the storytellers say is impossible. To never see what is possible is to forever be captive of the impossible. If you ever retreat, I've got to pick up the end of the last, it had to do with the method that you do see what's going on. That one time you did see life eye to eye, which is to see the validity of whether you can do anything or not. But once you begin to re-see it, once you begin to recall it yourself, that is, that you begin to become non-standard in your own consciousness, you become your own mythical knight. You're up to that point. If you then ever retreat or excuse yourself, and the excuse is, hey, things are out of my hands. Hey, you don't know what, I've always been like this. I've always had a great temper. I've always been shy. I've always been pushed around. I've always had it bad. If you start to become your own mythical knight, if you've ever gotten that far, and you ever retreat or begin to excuse yourself, uh, for a living hero once dead, as opposed to mythical heroes, to imagine fairy tales. Because if you're alive, if you once become alive, and then you fall back into that, I'm not trying to make anybody particularly feel bad, but for a living hero, once dead, you ain't getting back up. You can't be revived. 
Everybody had their one chance. You were supposed to blink and look away. If you do it twice, you don't get to blink again. So even if life's out of your hands, so what? Hey, I can't help myself. There's really nothing to say to anybody like that. There's nothing to say to you. Even if it's true. Remember, I put there on the paper, even if it's true. Hey, I can't help it. Even if true, so what? It is then that you mistake an imaginary horse for a real horse, the lack of one. You mistake the mythical, which is the possible, for the historical, which is impossible. That I should be like so-and-so, uh-uh. You've got to be like you are, but you've got to see what it is. And then you can have no comment. You can't go, wait a minute. That's all. So you went to all that effort for nothing. No, you didn't. Yes, you did. Did, not, did. 